Good evening, my name is Phil Schomber. I'm the adult programmer here at Hedberg, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all to our program tonight. It's also my pleasure to introduce our presenter, Kathy Watson. Kathy grew up here in Janesville, and after uh, graduating from high school here, she went on to get her bachelor's degree from UW-Whitewater, and then her master's degree from Northwestern University, both in her specialty, communication. Kathy has worked for nearly three decades, writing and editing both in the corporate and academic worlds. She currently writes for the UW College of Engineering, in addition to working with multiple PhD candidates. Yes. Um, she's also written a book, Grammar for Those Who Hate Rules. People Who Hate Rules, yes. My apologies, People Who right. Hate Rules. Um, but if you hate rules, why stick with the book title, right? No, no, People Who Hate Rules. Um, and she's gonna share the tips she's learned in the process of putting that book together and getting it published. So would you please welcome Kathy Watson. Thank you. Thanks to Phil for arranging it and putting it all together. I should do a sound check. Can you hear me in the back? Okay, I think he's going to get an extra table or some extra handouts. How many authors, published authors, do we have here tonight? A number, okay. How many people have a manuscript in process right now? Lots, okay. How many have just ideas germinating about what you might want to write? Oh, you know, that's almost pretty well balanced, so we've got a little bit of everything. Um, well, I, I don't claim to know everything there is about self-publishing, but I learned a lot in my experience. And I have to share that I have a confession I really never wanted to write a book. I have never wanted to. In all my years of writing, people would say, oh, what do you write? Do you write books? And I say, no. And what would I write about? And then um, as my business evolved and everyone needed to have a website to promote yourself and become known, so I started a website. And the research showed me that you needed to have fresh copy to keep, it, keep people coming back for something. So I started writing what then was a column. The, the word blog didn't exist yet, but it started as a, a monthly column. And then gradually, um, more people were writing and there was more in, on the internet and blogging started or became known as blogging. So then it wasn't a column, it was a blog. And I went from once a month to once a week. And all this time, I'm accumul accumulating what I call my killer tips, killer tips from the ruthless editor. And this is a little bit more about my background, but I've worked in a variety of fields, and so I've seen a lot of the errors that people make in the business world, especially because that's where I've done a lot of my work of more common interest. And the person who worked with me on my website said, why don't you write a book? You could just take all your columns and organize them and compile them. And I first said, no, I don't, I'm not interested and I don't have time. So she kept working on me and so finally I decided what the heck, I might as well try it. Guess how long it took me? Four years. <laughs> and it was really all written all I had to do was organize it, but it takes a lot of time to organize. Everything had to be edited for current, uh, current times. It had to be edited for space that it would fit on the pages because I had an idea of what I wanted it to look like in the end version. I'd done a lot of newsletters in my writing career, and so I had a certain graphic sense from the work I did laying out columns and laying out photos and elements of design like um, asymmetry is more pleasing than symmetry, black and white or dark contrast, and the other one was white space. So I took those three elements into consideration when I started planning my interior of the book. So for those of you, of course, published authors, you had a motivation. Those who have a manuscript, you have a motivation. Those of you who don't yet, what might be some motivations for writing a book? Because there's so much work involved, you really need to be passionate about it. And that's a word that's overused, but first of all, are you going to do fiction or nonfiction? Two fields. Is there something you have a lot of knowledge about that other people would be interested in knowing? Or have you had rich life experiences that you want to share or that you think other people might be interested in? Maybe it's a memoir that's gonna be just for family members. 
you gain recognition. If you are a speaker or want to be on a speaker circuit, it helps to have a book because it gives you credibility and then you can sell them in the back of the room. So there are lots of reasons to do it. Of those, which do you suppose, suppose is the least valid? Fame and fortune? Yeah. Anybody pick that out? OK. That's probably, especially if you're self-publishing, because it's, it takes a lot to promote. But fame and fortune, if you're um, a novice author, probably uh, should not be your first motivation, or you're going to be disappointed. But we'll see what we can do about that tonight. So you have motivation, and yet you have to think about who will want to read what I have to offer. Who is your reading audience? What ages? What professions might they be in? Where would you find them? Are people seeking your expertise if it's a nonfiction book? My book is on grammar, and I hope there are people who still care about it and still want to learn or refresh what they learned about grammar. Because in the workplace, communication is extremely important. And of course, now everyone communicates by email. And so writing skills really have gained renewed importance in today's workplace. What are publishers looking for? What, what's a publisher in business to do? Make money. Make money, aha. Yes, and so are they going to make money on Hillary Clinton or Senator Jeff Flake, or are they going to make money on? <laughs> yeah, so. So that's, that's one of the things that, um, as self-publishing has arisen, it's enabled people who possibly can't convince a traditional publisher that they can make them a lot of money. It gives you the opportunity to publish something that you think is worthwhile and then hope you find a reading audience for it, but have a target in mind before you start. I wonder if we could just get these front lights down. Does anybody know? Is Phil gone? Angela, do you think you could find somebody? Because I think it's, it's making the screen a little bit more difficult to see. So publishers are looking for somebody with a track record. So if you're not a published author, what else do you do? Are you an expert that has a following of some kind? Now for me, I had uh, when I started my uh, um, column and then went to a blog, I gradually built up an email list. And I would send out. A reminder at first just once a month that there was a new blog available and what it was. And so I developed, started to develop a following. And then gradually, people would be looking online for a topic that I covered, and they would take, take them to my website. And they might sign up for the blog, too. And so gradually, I built my mailing list. And actually, publishers are looking for probably thousands, tens of thousands. When you think you have a market of the world when you're writing a book, mine is about 435, which is really puny compared to what a, a traditional publisher would want. Um, and if you have an audience, can you track with the analytics what the, if you send out an email with information or you have a blog with a reminder, how many people open it? How many people comment on it? How many people share it? Those are all factors that support your ability to become a successful author, to develop a following, people who know you or want what you have to offer. And of course, then social media came into the world as, uh, the realm as well. And young people seem to be very, very good at it. And they understand it. They know how to manipulate and use it. I suspect more of the people in this room probably aren't quite as familiar as people who are texting, um, walking around talking on their texting on their phones all day. So, but that's another area where you can really reach a vast audience is through social media. I found a website. It's called Hire My Mom. And I hired um, a young woman who's raving, raising a family and doesn't want to go out in the workforce but wants to stay active. And so she does social media for me. So there are places to find help economically that you can plug into some of the ways that you would need to promote when your book is ready. Traditional publishers are looking for people who already ha are connected with, with others who might help promote it, who might speak in your behalf. And of course, if you, if you have re relationships with anyone in the media, that also can be helpful. Speaking engagements, have you done speaking? Are you prominent in your field? Have you won awards or been a finalist? Even if you are a runner-up runner in a baking contest, 
If you were a runner-up, that could qualify you with the credibility that you could write a, a cookbook or a book all about pies or some specialty like that. So there are all kinds of ways to plug into specialties. And have you successfully marketed anything? Um, I have a friend who's a dietitian, and she has developed a protein powder line, and she has about 22 or 23 retail outlets, health food stores and supermarkets where that's available. So if she were to ever write a book, she could turn to her success selling her products and, and her information because she does counseling as well. The beauty of self-publishing versus traditional publishing is that anyone can do it. Anyone in this room could do it with some knowledge and some um, support and encouragement. There is so much online. There really, there really is an industry emerging just to help people self-publish books. There's nothing you can't find on the internet. I know that's a double negative, but it's the truth. You get control over your material. Um, yes, you should have an editor, but if you have a publisher, that editor is probably going to have a little more input or a little more to say about what the final product looks like. There are two primary, this is important information now, there are two primary ways that self-publishers can get their books on the market. One is CreateSpace, and that's the publishing arm of Amazon. You need to write your book, have a cover, have the book formatted, do all the preparation, and then when you, those electronic files are ready, you upload them to CreateSpace. I always recommend everyone get a paper copy for a final proof, but then your book automatically will be on Amazon. So CreateSpace is connected to Amazon. The other one that probably fewer people have heard of, have, has anyone ever heard of Ingram Spark? A few, okay. Um, Ingram Spark is the distributor that is the broadest world, worldwide. And Ingram Spark does business with libraries, but especially with bookstores. Because why would Bookworld on Milton Avenue want to order books for their store from Amazon, from CreateSpace? They're the, Bookstores are the competitors, exactly. So create space. Incidentally, you can, you can publish a book for zero dollars. If you, if you do all the work yourself, maybe barter edit, editing services or design services with someone, um, and upload it on create space. We're going to talk about ISBNs in a minute. But, but you could, if you don't get an ISBN, create space will assign you one. So you can publish a book for zero dollars. Now Ingram Spark, it costs $49 to upload a file. That has come down since I published my book. They're trying to be more competitive with CreateSpace for one thing. But also, um, they charge for revisions. And I guarantee you that you may think you're uploading a, a um, perfect file because you've had it edited so many times. This is what my first paper proof looked like proof copy. That was the number of corrections I thought my perfect file needed. So when you, and even, even before I got the proof, I encourage everyone to print your pages out on your computer and then assemble them so that you can see how the facing pages will go. It helps make sure you don't forget in numbering. But also there's just something about reading from a paper proof that's different from reading on the screen. So it's a lot of paper, it's a lot of ink. I know cartridges are expensive, but it could save money in the long run of having to redo and redo and redo your files if you're with Ingram. I think I've probably uploaded about five files since I started, um, but that, and that was my first cover. We're gonna talk about covers. So Ingram, CreateSpace is Amazon. Ingram Spark is a broader supplier internationally, and they supply Barnes and Nobles and independent bookstores. Um, another thing about Ingram, if your book is available only on Amazon, Barnes and Noble won't stock your book. They will order it for someone who goes in and asks for it, one copy, but they will not have a stock in their store and they also, you probably wouldn't be able to get an event. 
in a Barnes and Noble store. And that can be one way that an author, how many have done in-store events of the Polish people? Just one? Okay. And then the other element about self-publishing is with print on demand, somebody can order your book and get one copy. Sometimes with publishers, they'll, especially smaller ones, they'll want you to order an initial maybe 500 copies. And nobody needs boxes of books in their garage. You want them to be out and circulating. And so when someone can order on Amazon and get it within a week, that's a pretty good deal. The numbers about how many, there's a lot of competition. The numbers of books that are published, self-published, is a little hard to put your finger on. One way they count is to tra trace how many ISBNs were issued. ISBN is International Standard Book Number. International Standard Book Number. And every book that you want to be available commercially has to have an ISBN. And it's generally, well, and so in 2016, and I've checked recently, I still haven't found the 2017 results, but there were 787,000 ISBNs issued. That doesn't necessarily mean that many books were self-published or published in general, because sometimes people will buy a batch of ISBNs and not use them all at the same time, which we'll talk a little more about. So there's a lot of competition. That's what that tells us. Amazon, I've seen figures that Amazon has available online between 43 and 85 percent of books published in the U.S. You can find small publishers. Some of them are, are very um, honest and ethical and good to do business with. Some of them are a little bit scammy. And you have to just really be careful if you find a small publisher Get refer, ask them how many books, how many authors they've worked with. Try to talk to authors who have used that publisher. Find out if the ISBN belongs to you or belongs to the publisher. Um, in general, really do some thorough research to determine that they're a good match for your needs and your, uh, what kind of book you have. If you do something like a company history, you don't need an ISBN. This is, it happens to be from the Cullen Company locally. They did a history um, of their company, and it's a beautiful piece. It has interior color photos and um, a lot of the projects they've worked on. But this one doesn't have an ISBN. That's the little, it's shown in a little barcode in the back. If you're doing a cookbook for a PTA group or parent teachers group, what do they call them these days? For a parent teacher organization, or for perhaps for a church fundraiser, or maybe 4-H or something like that. You don't need to get an ISBN for that if you're just selling them one-to-one, uh, -one, for example. There are complete publishing services, and one of them that I like to follow is Book Baby. I'm not recommending them. I'm not endorsing them. But I'm saying they're one that you can find online and get an idea of what, uh, what packages publishers have to offer. They will help you design the cover. They'll do the interior format. They'll provide you with an ISBN. And, but they don't provide this uh, $14.99 package that does not include editing. And editing is a, is a key step for especially self-published authors. So editing, depending on the size of your book and your topic, would probably be at least another 1,000 to 1,500, or maybe more if it's a long novel, for example. But it would be interesting to uh, find that online, Google it, and just get a description of how they work with self-published authors. ISBNs was one of the hardest things for me to get my head around, I'd like to say, because I do words, not numbers. But an ISBN is the barcode on the back of a book that has a row of numbers, and that is like a fingerprint. It tells everything about your book. It tells the dimensions, how many pages, the title, who the author is, who the publisher is, the cost. So it's, it's uh, something if you go into a store and you pick a book and you buy it, that tracks the sales in addition. So an ISBN is an identifier. 
usually a 13-digit number. It used to be, I think it used to be 10, and then there are probably some in this library that are just 10 digits, but 13 is the standard amount of numbers. Identifies your book, denotes everything about it, totally identifies it. There is one official source of ISBNs in this country, and it's called either Bowker or Boker. I'm not sure what the pronunciation is. And you can get them at myidentifiers.com. One is $125, but you can get 10 for $295. So I may not do numbers, but that's funny math to me. Um, remember I said you could publish a book for zero dollars? You can, if you work with someone like Book Baby, no, you'd be paying them. Let's, let's no, forget, if you're, if you're publishing a book on your own and doing everything yourself or having someone help you where you're not paying them, if you upload your book on CreateSpace, they will provide an ISBN free. Then they own the publishing rights to your book. So that might seem like a shortcut. You want to get a book up, you want it on Amazon, you want it available all over but you just don't feel you can afford to invest in that ISBN. So let's say Amazon assigns you one and you go about your merry way. Maybe all of a sudden the book starts really selling, getting popular. And an agent finds it and calls you and said, I think I'd, I might have a publisher to match you with for, for your next one or for this one for further distribution. Because CreateSpace owns your ISBN, you cannot work with anyone else. They own the publishing rights. So I recommend that a self-publishing author purchase his or her own ISBN. And why would you need 10? You need one ISBN for every version of your book. So you need one for a print paperback. You need one for an ebook. If you wanted to do an audio book, you'd need one. And if you wanted to do a hardcover, you'd need one. So you could, at some point, need four ISBNs for one book. So even if you think you might not publish a second book, it still probably makes sense to buy the package of 10 and to have them available for whatever else you might want to do with it. And they're, they're not changeable. You can't sell your ISBN to anyone, and you can't uh, share it with anyone because it, it goes, it's recorded with Bowker and they know who belongs to what ISBNs, what ISBNs belong to which authors. I, I did recent research, research that said in Canada they're free. So I, does, does anybody know if that's, if that's true in Canada? No way. Okay. It's just a difference in countries. The U.S. is in charge of those for the U.S. France has a, or, you know, a supplier. Germany would have a supplier. Every country has its own. But this is the going rate for, for what's available here. Any questions about ISBNs at this point? Yes. So if you got your ISBN from CreateSpace on your first book, how do you, what needs to change in that book version-wise or mm. edition-wise where you could switch to Bowker? And do a second did. Question is, how does your initial book have to change if you've got an ISBN from CreateSpace, if you want to do a second edition, but you want to be able to get it um, on, on with work with Ingram Spark, for example? No, that's right. No, you can't. If you, I'm sorry. If, if you want to change your, if you, if you got a free ISBN, right. right, and you want to have freedom to be your own publisher, what do you have to do to that book to make it different? Right. Probably not a, a great deal. Probably, in fact, that's one thing I'm entertaining right now. Should I do a second edition? I might add six more chapters because they're short chapters. You have to, you have to make changes that are apparent but they, it doesn't have to be a vast, vast redo. That's about as much detail as I know about it at this point. Okay. So you could get away by doing a second. If it's a novel, you'd have a little harder time, I think, changing it than, a, than for a, a nonfiction book. Anything else about ISBNs? Yes? Uh, do they use QR codes? 
I, I, you might be able to have one on your book. I can't say I've seen a lot of books that have QR codes. Question was, <coughs> did you say can you have or do you have? Um, either, way. either way, okay. No, in fact, you know, of this table, I don't have any book that has a QR code on it, just the standard barcode. Anything else about ISBN? Oh, you said QR code. You said QR code. Oh, it's, it's that little square. It's a black and white. It doesn't have bars. It's just like a little black and white pattern in it. Oh. <coughs> and it's an identifier of some kind, yeah. Yes, you can use your phone to scan it, right. Yes? Do they expire if you purchase 10 and say you only needed one for a paperback and one okay. for an e-book? Does an ISBN expire? No. So you own them even though they're not assigned to any particular work? That's right. They're assigned to you as a person. And, they're, and then um, they also uh, sometimes a um, book designer will apply one for you, but you have to buy it in the first place. But I mean, they'll design it in the book cover once they know what it is. Anything else about ISBNs? OK, we'll move on. Did, it, did I see a hand? No. OK. <clears throat> So how can you have your book available on CreateSpace, Amazon, and through Ingram Spark? You buy your own ISBN. And it's also recommended that you upload your, your file first to Ingram Spark and get it registered with them. And then after that, I'll upload it to CreateSpace. And there's a fine detail. We can't cover everything tonight. But when you go to CreateSpace, you have to check. Um, you don't check. Is it extended distribution, expanded distribution? You don't pick that with uh, CreateSpace because you're getting all of the distribution you need through Ingram Spark beyond Amazon. Uh, I mentioned Barnes and Noble would not stock a book unless it's listed with uh, with Ingram Spark and buy your own from Bulk or upload your own. And then, you, then you've got much broader distribution. So let's consider some covers. You can design your own. And if it looks like it's designed by an amateur, it won't be as appealing. In fact, I noticed when I was, I stopped at Bookworld on the way in and left a couple of my books there. <clears throat> they stock them generally. And they had a, a shelf of books that had the, the spine and then the front, and the spine and then the front. So every book, you could see the cover as well as the spine. So is the cover of a book important? You can't tell a book by its cover? I think this is a contradiction. People will judge a book by its cover. And I want to just show you some and see what you think. Dark, serious. This is by a, um, a police officer in Arizona who was involved, got a call for a domestic abuse situation. And he went out with two other offices, officers. There was gunfire. And in the darkness of a mobile home, a perpetrator shot into his face. But the shell was blank. So it didn't kill him. It just, there was something that burned him a little bit. Anyway, he, had, he developed PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. And this is his story about how he dealt with it. So that cover kind of gives you a sense of this is a dark, there's some dark parts to this story. This one is an author, I met him up in Spring Green last summer. When he was six, his mother developed um, tuberculosis. So she took this six-year-old and his younger sister to an orphanage in Racine. And they lived there for a couple of years when she got better uh, she never did take them into her care again. So he, both he and his sister lived there until he was 11, and then they both went to separate foster homes. However, it was a very benevolent home. The, the ra staff uh, ratio to children there was very high. They got good food. They went to school. They had um, relaxation time. And it's kind of a dark cover, but it really is an uplifting story. So we have two covers that aren't that different one from the other, and yet What's the content is very different.
here's one by a University of Wisconsin professor. She specializes in, in brain research, and she wrote about multitasking. And this book is not that, about three or four years old. I look, you can't see it way in the back. But how antiquated does that computer equipment look? I mean, does it look like a modern day digital age book? Not really. I don't think she was well served by the person who designed this cover for her. This one is about selling. But if you saw it, can you read these small words? Even this close, you can't. So it, that really hurts the impact of the book if you're looking at the cover. Another thing about this one is the, the spine has what's called reverse type. In other words, there's an orange background, and then the letters are white. And there's not enough contrast to read that clearly. So this really, um, I don't mind the color combinations. That's what her business card is and um, her stationery and, and all the rest. But it, it really is not a very captivating cover. This one is written by a UW lacrosse professor. And he teaches health and uh, nutrition and exercise and things like that. And once a year, he would do a lecture for his students on myths. And he got some feedback that they thought that was the best lecture of the year. So he took a number of the myths that he was familiar with and published them in a book. It's a little bit busy, but would you pull it off the shelf and look at it? Is it intriguing at all? Thumbs up or thumbs down? Thumbs up, OK. Oh, one down. Here are a couple more. This is a colleague of mine in Arizona, and she writes about words, words that trip people up. And it's words that either sound alike or have the same kind of structure in some way, but are, are, have different meanings. And this is a, a woman who writes about positivity. She had a job in a tech, tech company, and she lost her job, so she went back to school, got a PhD in the field of research that has to do with living a positive life, and she wrote a book about it. I should have asked for each one, thumbs up or thumbs down. Is this appealing? Easy to read? OK. And how about the positive edge? The colors are bright and happy and uplifting. Consider that compared to this. When I first started um, my book, this was the cover. And then it ended up like this. And I did use a, a service. And I'm sure there are some people who prefer this one and think this one is too busy. But this screams at you if you see it on the shelf. It can't be ignored. And that was one thing I wanted. So th that's how the uh, designer ended up working with it. <clears throat> I'm sorry. This is not my own, my own control, so I'm a little backwards. These three examples, there are sites where you can go on and find just book covers, just pages and pages. Have some of you done that? Um, there's a huge variety. And these three books were written by um, a neighbor and colleague in Arizona. He was in, in Vietnam. He was a helicopter pilot. And his first one was Howling Across Bridges. And what he does, he goes online and he looks at covers pages and pages and scrolls. And then if one reaches out and grabs him, really catches his attention, he'll buy that cover, and then he'll write a story to support it and to go with it. Which is, to me, backwards. But he's a geophysicist, and he writes novels. And he had, um, this is about Howling Across Bridges, about a soldier who survived Vietnam, came back, and was lost. And he decided to get a motorcycle. And he drove around the country visiting the families of his um, fellow soldiers who didn't make it. So, and he, he comes across this old, matted, kind of beat up dog along the way. And the dog becomes his companion. But it's a really tender story about what he goes through. So that's how he developed that one. And the knock on the sky is about that guy. He meets someone, then he gets married. And so then he's got a third one, too. The middle one, Julius, that's a children's book. And he just ordered, he um, downloaded art from online, lion art, and manipulated it 
um, so that it would work for a cover. And then he also used it on the inside of the book where there's a, an African scene that spans the covers. It's, it's um, shaded, so it's very light, so it doesn't interfere with the words. But covers, covers do matter. And if you have a nonfiction book, it's more difficult, I think, because with a novel, something will, be, will help identify the theme of it or a character. Whereas with a nonfiction book, if you're dealing with um, how to be the best financial advisor in the world or whatever, you, you might not find a cover that lends itself well to that. The way I decided, um, worked on my cover, I went to, the, to a Barnes & Noble store when I finally decided to do the book. And I said, where are the grammar books? And they said, oh, they're way back in the corner on the bottom shelf. And so I went back, and I took all of them off the shelf, and I laid them in front of me so that I could compare the covers of each one and see what attracted my eye. And, and I took a picture with my phone of them so I could work with my designer on it. So then I turned them all over and looked at the backs and took pictures of those. What went on the back? Was it a, a more about the book? Was it little quotations, testimonials? Was it a little author profile? And these were, and, oh, and I also counted the page. I made a note. I counted the number of pages, and I counted the price. And I wrote down the author, because credibility of an author is important, more so probably in nonfiction books than in novels. But this first one um, on your left, Between You and Me, is written by Catherine Norris. She has been an editor for The New Yorker her entire life, so she has a lot of credibility. But the yellow is too soft for me. It just, the yellow didn't grab me. And the yellow and red is kind of a strange combination, too. But I noticed um, the two, two of them that I looked at had red, and so I thought, hmm, maybe I should use red on my book. I since have had someone tell me that um, seniors, people our age, some of our ages, don't like red. It's a turnoff for them. So, But so much packaging has red in it. Woe is I, this is by Patricia O'Connor. She used to be a book reviewer for the New York Times. And so she too has a lot of credibility. Um, I have bought, I bought this copy and I've got her third edition and I like the book. But each time it gets thicker and it's reaching a point where it's almost overwhelming. But I didn't like the white space in the middle. I thought it was too much white. And from a design perspective, you're not supposed to have captured white space. If you've got white space, it should be on the edges. So then that's how I ended up with mine. I had a business card with that red wave in it. And so I thought that would make a good marketing package because I have bookmarks, which you all have one of too, that has that red wave. And there's enough contrast that it catches your eye and you can read it from a distance. Has anybody used online book cover sources of the published authors? What, I'm curious, what did some of you do for book cover design? Yes. Designed your own. And was it, is yours fiction or nonfiction? Nonfiction. Okay. You wouldn't like it. Well, <laughs> she said I wouldn't like it. <laughs> it was a nonfiction book and she designed her own cover. I have one with me. Oh, do you? Well, do you want to share it? No. Oh. <laughs> Anybody else while she's looking at, yes, what did you do uh, my for it? My daughter did my illustrations. Okay. And does she have design background or she's just good with computer programs? Oh, yeah, oh, and she okay. Has do you want to see it? Do you have it? <laughs> sure. 33 Annual Wild and Wacky Holiday Occasions by Rita Beck. There, and look at the back. She has a very interesting back. It's very busy. Well, it is busy, but if it's wild and wacky, it can be busy. Yeah. That goes with the. Thanks for sharing that. And yours? <clears throat> Oh my, oh, <laughs> she brought a library. So we've got Ida May's Borrowed Trouble. Now is that eye catching? Yes, and it's big enough for most of you to see. A lot of energy and excitement, fear there. And Beasties, I think that's charming. Beasties, and we have two more. Digital Girl and the Green Ghosts. What age group is this for? It would be about seven through ten-ish. Okay. I think that would appeal. And here we have 
Gloppy. Gloppy is a bowl of chili that comes alive. A bowl of chili that comes alive. Okay, those are charming covers. Aren't you lucky to have a connection? Now see, that's how you can publish a book for nothing if you know people who can do things like that for you. Thank you for sharing those. Thank you. Those are great. So bottom line, a cover is important. I'm sorry, I keep going backwards with this. <clears throat> book interiors, an interior is important too for readability. Um, and I want to make a comparison. And I can't find the other one. Oh, here it is. Um, my book is, each chapter almost entirely is just two pages long. And I wanted it so that when you opened to a chapter, you could read the whole chapter in the two pages. That meant I had to break a rule. This book also has two pages per chapter, and it starts on page one, like it's supposed to. Oh, introduction, she's got a lot. Okay, so here's page one. Page one is always on the right side for a reader. If you start on page one, your chapter ends on page two on the page behind it. And then your next chapter starts here, and you have to turn the page to, to read it in full. But partly since I self-published, I could do what I wanted to. So I don't have a page one in my book. And you know, I've never had anybody miss it or say anything about it or ask me where page one was. So my book starts on page two, so that every chapter you open it and you have the full chapter in front of you. So you can see it from beginning to end. There are some other elements of layout. Um, readability, there are certain fonts that are more readable than others and there are recommendations for those, white space. I think it's very common in a lot of layouts to have um, this deep white space at the beginning of a chapter, whether it's a novel or whether it's a nonfiction book. It's a little bit easier on the eye if you don't open a book and just see solid masses of gray text page after page. So that's one way of delineating that you're starting a new chapter. <clears throat> Uh, we're going to look at justified type in a minute. The first pages often are what are called blurbs in the industry. They're little testimonial type quotes that say good things about your book and why, why people should buy it. Now, I didn't have those because I haven't published before, but I sent my manuscript to some people, and some people were familiar with my work just because of my blogs, and so they felt right, comfortable writing a supporting comment. And I think for a self-published author, first-time author, those are really important because it adds to your credibility that someone with credibility would write a nice thing about your book. So that's another thing to do before you put it all together in the final stages is to try to get some support that attests to the content and your ability as, a, as an author. A lot of times, too, the first pages have little Roman numerals at the bottom. I eliminated those. I don't pay attention to them. I don't know what good they do. Um, there, a lot of times there's a foreword. I just have an introduction. You know, when you self-publish, you can kind of pick and choose what you want your book to be like. And I put my acknowledgments at the end, because who cares about that when they're just getting into your book? Who helped you and your husband supported you and your aunt cooked meals while you were out there? You know, things like that. Are they really of interest if somebody pick, picks up your book for the, for the topic, for the content? And then odd numbers, I mentioned those. This is what, up in the left corner, that's what, I think, does everybody start in Microsoft Word? Anybody not start in Microsoft Word? Okay, well that, that's what a Word document would look like. When it's formatted for reading, there's more space between the lines so that the text is easier to follow. The margins, there has to be a wider this is the gutter. There has to be a wider margin in the middle to allow for the, the spine so that when you open the book, the type doesn't run right into the inside edge. Um, it's got these little doodads to start a new chapter. This is all capitals versus capitals and lowercase combined in the rest. 
So those things that are done, uh, those things are done in the formatting. And you can buy formats. One of the uh, resources sheet uh, has Joel Friedlander on it. And he has formats for novels, for nonfiction, for this and for that, so that each format is customized to the kind of material that you're writing. Those are for purchase. Again, I don't get anything for referring him, but he really has good insights about the publishing industry and has a lot of help available for people who are publishing their own books. One thing that I encourage everyone to do is to develop what's called a style sheet. And for, for your book, it just needs to be a sheet of paper. I started mine on a little clipboard. So for example, um, when I was writing the chapter headlines, was I going to use all capitals like that sample we just saw? Was I going to do upper, lower case? Was I going to capitalize every word? Was I going to lower case the in short words like that? so that I didn't have to go back to the chapter before every time to see what I did. I just wrote out a headline on my little style sheet. I could look at that every time when I started the next one. In the book about the children's home, he, the official name of it was the Taylor Children's Home. But every time he mentioned it again, he referred to it as the home, but he capitalized home. Now that's not consistent with any standard style that you'd see, but he did it and he did it consistently. And that's, what's part, that why, that's why a style guide helps, because you should be consistent for the reader. If you're going to refer to home, capitalize once, then you should do it throughout the book. If you're writing ages, do you write out S-E-V-E-N or do you use the number seven? Most novels write them out. Seven-year-old would be like the second example. I think you'd be more likely to uh, use numerals in a nonfiction book. When do you use italics? A lot of times foreign words are italicized. Or in a novel, if you're doing dialogue and someone is just thinking to themselves, you would put that probably in italics rather than use quotation marks. There are three style guides um, that I use most frequently. There's the Chicago Manual of Style, and this is what most um, fiction writers would follow. This is an expensive book. I don't know if they have a um, if they have an online service where you can you can um, en enroll in it and then get monthly updates, and then you can free to search online. But the Chicago Stanual Manual of Style. This is kind of a cheat sheet for it, and it's only $6.95, and it really has a lot of the basics. You could probably get by with this. It's full of information. You might need a magnifying glass to read it because it's small. They've got so much crammed into the space. But I'm sure you could order this at Book World or uh, Barnes & Noble. You could get it on Amazon, too. I don't have Prime, so I'd have to pay shipping, and I wouldn't pay shipping on something like this. But it's a, it's a wonderful, for, for people who write fiction, it's a wonderful guide you can look up what, what's capitalized, how do you use an ellipsis, and just everything that you won't think of until you get into the writing of a book. For nonfiction, um, this is what I'm most familiar with, and I do subscribe to the online, is the Associated Press style book. And this is used more in business writing or in nonfiction books. And it tells you what to capitalize, what to hyphenate, what to italicize, what to abbreviate all the little things that you come across when you're writing a book and probably had never thought about before. And then the third major one is, um, this is more for academic reading and science, writing and scientific, it's the uh, American Psychological Association. So the two PhD candidates I'm working with, I have to use this and I put tags into the stuff that I find I have to go back and look at more often. But for, for a book of your own, you just need one sheet. And then as something comes up where you realize you have to go back and look, then you enter that in your style sheet. And it simplifies the process and keeps your book consistent for your readers. Does anybody know the difference between the serial Oxford comma and regular commas? Someone in the back there. <laughs> Do you want to tell us? I believe the Oxford, if you have a series, the Oxford says you put a 
comma before the and at the end. Correct. Um, but others say that that's... Some, some people call not putting the comma in Cambridge. I don't think that's an official term. But if you have, you're having coffee, toast, and eggs for breakfast, Oxford is coffee, comma, toast, comma, and eggs. Um, the AP style would say coffee, comma, toast, and eggs. It sounds like a small thing, but if you're going to use commas in your book, and surely you all are, you should consistently decide, are you going to use the serial comma? And that's what uh, Chicago Manual of Style recommends. So for a fiction book, that's what I would plan on using. Whereas nonfiction, I probably wouldn't. Those are some of the fine points. And th those are things that an editor can catch for you as well. Inconsistencies. If you're doing, if you're writing a book, you might as well do an e-book as well as a print book. The only thing um, that might change your mind would be if you have, for example, a lot of illustrations in it, because e-books are generally just text. So, um, and color illustrations are, almost would make printing a book prohibit. Where did you have yours printed? Um, Was it through a publishing service? OK. But yeah, I went through a service that helps people publish the book. Mm-hmm. OK. <laughs> yeah, of course, you're chunk of money, but I would say Sure. Well, and, and your book is, it doesn't have a lot of pages, so that helps. If you were to do a novel with, and want to do color f illustrations or photos, it would just be prohibitively, expen in ex prohibitively expensive, um, because color printing is, is much more expensive. Sometimes a, a pencil illustration, in fact, this um, gentleman has illustrations throughout his, but he knows the illustrator, and the illustrator offered to do them for him. And, and none of them are color. They're all, all black and white, so they could be printed right along, you know, with just with the pages. Um, but generally, color is a lot more expensive to print. So e-books wouldn't have, wouldn't have pictures. And an e-book takes a different format than a print book does. It has to be configured differently. Um, I had to send mine out to a service that does that because I, I did it on price mainly. And it was someone in India. And I just hope the book was safe with that service and that it doesn't end up all over Europe from under a different name. But. In an ebook, you, you can't do as much <coughs> customizing. <coughs> do you know what soft returns are, everybody? My book has a lot of short examples. And if I followed the justified type where it had to be the, um, straight on the edges in each one, I would have huge gaps with a shorter, with a shorter sentence. It would try to make everything even, and it, it just does not lend itself to being justified. And so I have what's called ragged right. And there were times when a sentence would go too far and just look out of place with the way the rest of them were falling. So I would do what's called a, t a soft return. And I would just hit it and make it go down to the next line so it flows, so that everything was pleasing to the eye and didn't have any protrusions that stuck out a lot further than the lines above it. But you can't do soft. I couldn't do that in the ebook version, so it needed two very distinct and separate files. And when you uh, upload for an ebook, you don't need a back cover. You just need the front cover. <clears throat> Any questions about print versus ebooks? How many people have readers and, and use largely ebooks? A few? A few? Not, not the majority. <clears throat> How do you price your book? That's another challenge where the best thing to do is to make comparisons. Um, number of pages, credibility of the author. It really helps to go to a bookstore and take some off the shelves. Find, find your genre, whatever it is, if it's young adult fiction or if it's science fiction or cookbooks, and find out the range of prices that other books are selling for. There's no way you could say, I have this much time in it, and I want this many dollars per hour. 
because I'm sure you under, can understand how it would be way beyond what's sellable. Not knowing how many, what the quantity we, would be of the books that you um, would end up getting out onto the market. will it cost? Um, this is a very, very, very difficult question to answer because it depends on how many services you have to pay for yourself and how many things you can either barter for or have a family friend or relative do for you. One thing that, and I, I realize I'm standing here as an editor, but so many people say don't cut short the editing. For most people, it's been a while since we sat in an English classroom or maybe since we've been doing a, a lot of writing and you tend to forget, plus things change, words change, punctuation, the punctuation marks don't change, but the, we, we use fewer commas than we used to use. And so to pick an editor, preferably in your genre, um, to find someone who's a specialist. And with a fiction book, you really need to have a, a, what's called a developmental editor, somebody who can analyze character development, can analyze your, the theme that flows through the book and if it's consistent. I had someone recently who's writing a, she's written one book and she's on her second one. And her book started out, it was a beautiful spring day, and the, but these two children went missing. And so they found their bikes down by the lake but the pier was blown out because there had been an earthquake that day. It was a beautiful spring day, but there was an earthquake. And you know, it was just, what? <laughs> so, and so those kinds of things, it might seem like you're telling the story in a way that makes it flow, but to someone else, they will catch, wait a minute, you get so immersed in it that, that you aren't objective necessarily. And so things like that, how, how does it flow? How are your characters being developed? Are there contradictions? Are you focusing too much on one or another? That's not the kind of editing <clears throat> that I do. I am, I'm on the copy editing things, copy editing end. I look for punctuation and grammar and word use. I, I really prefer not to edit fiction because it's, it's a different set of skills, it's a different perspective, and it's a different experience. Of people who have published I'm curious what you used for editing. Would somebody volunteer to share? Yes. I used Upwork. Upwork, is that a program? It's online service. You use someone in India for? Yes, for developing the ebook. Upwork is you put in what you need and you get people from all over the planet oh. who um, bid for yes. the job. Yes, like Fiverr. Right, like it's another five. service, yeah. And I found someone in Fort Atkinson, ah. and so I used her. So she, I don't know if everyone heard that, she went online to a service called Up, Upwork. Upwork, Upwork, where you can uh, put out what you want and then people will bid on it. Yes, it, electronically you don't have to, certainly don't have to meet with someone in person oh, right. to hire someone for the work. How, were there ways you could check references? Yes, you, it's a, a whole process. You can go back and forth. They bid for the job they give you. They're, they're tested. Okay. Uh, you find out how many hours they put into doing other jobs. You get matched up with people who've done similar jobs. Um, Fiverr is similar. Similar, uh -huh. Fiverr, I think, is cheaper. You is know, it? They pretty much, they, they promote it saying, we'll do anything for five bucks. Well, you, you, you know. so you that's go, a stretch. Yes, yeah. take it from there. Uh, but it's it's, and you can choose to have only people from the U.S. Ah, you. so I and okay. I found someone in Fort Atkinson and took it from there. Did you ever meet with the person? Not yet. Oh, you're going I'm to them. I'm sending her an autograph copy of the book. Um, okay. I just put the stamps on the envelope. <laughs> Who else has used edit, editing services or an editor, or how did you find someone to edit your book? Well, with my book, the company I worked with has an editor for the content and then another copy editor. For the so, so the company you worked for provided you with service, worked with, I see. Oh, I see, the, edit, the publisher then, or the, okay. So that way you got recommended. Were you happy with it? 
Um, we argued about a few things, and I won a couple of grammar points. But okay. <laughs> but yes, uh, particularly for the, well, like the chapter books, the mm -hmm. editor I worked with, it, you know, it, it, was a, it was hard. It was a hard process. You think you've got a perfect thing, and then they come up with pages and pages. Oh. Did you all hear that? You, you think you've got things well done, and then an editor goes through it and comes up with pages and pages of comments and suggestions, I imagine. But they're up to you to decide what you accept and what not to accept. Is that right? That, was that your experience? Um, yeah, I took the most, uh, well, my editor's name was Eric. OK, I took most of Eric's things. Eric and I had some meaningful discussions on a few things. Uh -huh. um, like, you know, the bowl of chili. He's like, well, what is it really? It's a bowl of chili that comes alive. Well, no, no, come on now. What kind of animal is it? It is a bowl of chili that comes. He had no imagination, did he? <laughs> <laughs> we worked our way through this, and, mm -hmm. but he, he was very useful. He did a lot of good work on this book. OK, so you've, it was beneficial. It you learned how to work with an editor, and he learned some things about chili. fiction and chili. <laughs> yeah. Was, was there someone else over here who has published a book? Anybody else who said, ah, OK. I had a publisher, so. You had a publisher? Yeah. All right. Editors just would send it back and send it back and back and forth. How many times did you go back and forth, do you recall? It's kind of embarrassing. Oh, it shouldn't be embarrassing. Six? Yeah. I would guess that's. I had done it like four or five times myself before I sent it. Okay. I think that's one of the hardest things for a new author to realize is that you really have to write and rewrite and rewrite and rewrite to really get a good product at the end. And, and you get so sick of reading your own material by the time you've done it that many times. So another set of eyes is valuable. But I, I don't recommend having friends do it, even if they were maybe an English teacher, because they won't want to hurt your feelings and they won't tell you what you really need to do to improve your book. And so I think a, a, a disinterested party works a, a whole lot better. And I'm sure there are people online who do editing who are available for. And if they have a specialty, that's even better. Because if they really are good with mysteries, that's the person you want to work with, who can do a good job for your subject matter, for your topic. Um, any more questions about that? Editing? Do, I'm just, yes? I had a question on the book covers you said. On the covers? Yes. You said there's a website that's just full of book covers. There are multiple websites. I think if you just went and Googled book cover designs, you would have a lot of choices. Uh huh. And then you get just the graphic part, and then um, either you with, with computer programs or a designer will put in the title and those kinds of things. But you get the, the art part. I think the most that uh, Jim, the, the, the guy I showed you who gets the covers and then writes the stories, I think he might have paid a little over $100 for one. But uh, that bothered, he thought that was a lot of money. So just to give you a sense for, in fact, I, I know a friend who um, had someone share a book with her and she was thinking about writing one and he told her he paid, I think, $1,000 for the cover. Mm -hmm. Georgia, is that right? <laughs> Do you remember that? <laughs> OK. Anyway, th th there's a range. There's a range of, of it's like art, any time art. It's, it's the eye of the beholder. What's valuable to you? And what do you think you can't live without? Does the book designer get cover, uh, get credit? They might, mm -hmm. especially if it's, if it's done especially for you in some way. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, too, in the credits, they'll have cover design by, or even if your picture is on the back, um, author photo by. Yeah, it's good to always give credit. Mm -hmm. If it's a service, I don't know that you'd have to do that. They would probably let you know if they wanted mm -hmm. credit for it. For, um, we haven't talked about copyright, have we? Let, let's finish this page first. Let's see, what will it cost? How much you could spend on editing? And always do a paper proof yourself, print it out somehow, figure out a way to print it out on, 
on your printer. I know that's a lot of paper and a lot of cartridge, but um, it's, it will save you money of having things redone later. And then paper proofs. And you also should get a paper proof, as I showed, from, so that you can see, this one was from Amazon, Create Space, so that you can see exactly what the colors are going to be, um, what the finish is, and how the type fits the page, and just all of that. And, and read it again, read it again, word for word. Have someone else read it if you can. I had two editors that I worked. I had an early, worked with, I had an early stage editor. I sent her the Word documents of each chapter, and then she gave me feedback on those. And then after it was in layout, I sent someone else a digital version. The pages were arranged and formatted, but she just viewed it online and edited from that. And as with editing, you don't have to take suggestions. They're trying to be helpful, but you're the author, and, and it's your voice, and it's your material. So if it's something grammatical, you'd probably be more likely to. If it's um, like, what is chili? It was really an animal or whatever. If you think the book speaks for itself, and your editor is trying to get you to change that, you should have the right to say no. It's your work. It's your piece. What will you earn? Zillions and billions. <laughs> um, I estimate my production costs at about 1500 That was for, I paid the, even though, even though I knew the two editors I worked with, I paid them, told them I expected them to bill me. It wasn't a favor. I wanted them to give me their best work. Um, and I paid somebody to fine tune the cover design. And then I paid to have um, the files uploaded to Ingram. And I paid someone to format the ebook part of it. And that, that's where it, the prices started to accumulate. Every time I found a little error, you change it. And then it has to be reformatted. And if you're paying someone else to do that, it starts to get pricey after a while. So that's why you want to edit it so thoroughly, so thoroughly in the beginning. My book retails for $8.95. You round that off to $9. About a third of that $9, about a third of the selling price, is for to pr print the book and to send it to me, from Amazon to me. Um, about 30% goes to Amazon for marketing, for making it available, for handling, processing it, and shipping it out to somebody. They pay the shipping sometimes. And then the other 30% is profit. So on a $9 book, about $3 a book. That's through Amazon. It can be different if you get the books and have your own event and sell them yourself because you're not, um, someone isn't ordering it through Amazon and paying that price and they're not taking their marketing cut out of it. Ingram Spark, I'll be honest with you, I have not been able to figure out how they pay royalties. It, one is different, one report is different from another. Two other things I wanted to add about CreateSpace and Ingram Spark. CreateSpace has the best customer service of any, anyone I've ever dealt with. And I've had other people nod, yes. If you've got a question, they've got an answer. You can either go to chat, you can go to an online forum where questions are asked, or you can ask them, say you want to talk to someone, you click, I want someone to talk to, and you reach over it because your phone is going to ring immediately. <laughs> it's just, I don't know how they do it. They're just, they're well staffed. On the other side, Ingram Spark is one of the most difficult companies. Their website is not very intuitive. They're working on it, they're trying to improve, but um, it's just they don't have it as finely tuned because they, they are not as accustomed to working with self published authors as Create Space is. So sometimes they're just simply not available. Sometimes they'll call you back the next day. Sometimes you'll get somebody to chat with, and they'll be gone for 10 minutes looking up the answer to what your question is. So it takes a little bit more patience. But I still recommend being listed with, Am with Ingram Spark because of the broader distribution and exposure that you get with them. Oh, this was kind of fun. <laughs> I got a royalty, royalty payment from Japan. And I have no idea how many yen it was or what the amount uh, equivalent of dollars was. But I just thought, that made me feel good to know that my grammar book was going that far. People who are learning English and, and are 
want to understand everyday American English, is, which is the way I describe what, what my content is. Promotion. I found promotion to take longer and to take more energy than writing and publishing the book. Um, there's a question, how long do you have to promote your bo book? And the answer is, as long as you want people to buy it. You can't just plunk it through CreateSpace on Amazon and expect that it's going to get noticed. If it does, you'll be remarkably talented or remarkab remarkably lucky, but it really takes effort. And I have done every single one of these things to promote my book. Certainly you want to um, distribute to friends and family. Oh, I thought of another thing I found out about um, Ingram Spark now has a practice where if you pay $49 to upload your files, you can do two for that price. And if you order within two months, if you order 50 books, they will refund that upload fee. So they're trying to be more competitive. And quite honestly, I can't think of a book where you wouldn't need 50 copies. Family and friends to people who edit, helped you with editing, people who helped you with layout. The more hands your book gets into, the more people are going to see it. And so that's, that's an advantage, um, friends and family that you're sharing with. You could order those 50 from Ingram, and pretty soon you can figure out you've had a free upload. But um, I've sent emails, I've written letters, I've made phone calls. I've sent complimentary copies. That can be a tricky area because you don't want to send so many complimentary copies that you're just simply giving away your hard work and, and whatever money you've got involved in it. But to think strategically, one of my best paying complimentary copies was to Epic Systems in Verona. Anybody heard of them? They make medical software. I sent it to Judy Faulkner, the CEO. I know she's a very... Um, obscure, she doesn't like attention, she doesn't like to do interviews, but I sent one to her with a letter and suggested with their international business, they have people come and train at their headquarters. So this might be something that would be helpful. They could give them a gift possibly or make it available to them, for them. And I didn't follow up because I, I know she doesn't like to be bothered, but it took about five or six months and I got an email one day from a staff member, could we order a hundred of your books? Wow. Well, let me think about it. <laughs> No, I, I was thrilled. They have two on-site bookstores at their campus in Verona. And so um, I could envision this bookstore and my books on the shelf. And to this young woman who contacted me, I said, could I send a poster to go on the shelf to help draw people's attention to it? And she said, oh, just send me the PDF. We'll print it in-house and we'll put it up. And then she took a picture and showed me the poster with the books on the shelf. And uh, that was my first order, and they're still coming. So when you hit someone like that, but it took all those letters and all those phone calls and all those emails to a number of people before I finally got one to pay off. Um, but it did in, in good terms. Waiting rooms. Um, I left one at my financial advisor's office, my dentist's office, my internist's office, my pulmonologist's office. Anywhere you go where people sit and wait, even the Blue Spoon up in Prairie du Sac, they've got a waiting area with a little coffee table there, and I took a copy and, and left it there. It disappeared, so I took another one in. <laughs> but any time you can expose people to your book, expose your book to people, you never know who's going to see it and mention it to someone. Oh, the one, I left one in my dental office, and I got an email a few months later, um, and this was in Arizona, he said, we share the same dentist. I was in there and I saw your book and I found it captivating and I asked if I could buy it. And they said, well, no, no, it, it's an office copy. So he said, I went home and ordered six of them on Amazon to share with my family. So those little things, um, a book like mine with short chapters is probably more adaptable to a waiting room because someone can pick it up and flip through it. A novel, maybe not so much. Um, but you have to try everything because you just, you just don't know when it's going to strike gold. Um, hand to hand, I carry 
bookmarks in my purse all the time. If I go to the grocery store and there's a new person I haven't met before, I leave them a copy. If they're young, I say, are you a student? Oh, what's your major? Oh, I happen to have this grammar book you might find helpful. If you're majoring in journalism, oh, you've got to have my book. So um, you have to be on with it just all the time if you want your books to keep selling. Media interviews, I really struck out on that. And, and I used to do PR for a variety of companies. And I just have not had much luck. How many of you saw the Gazette article by Anna Marie Lux? A few, OK. She saw this library event scheduled, and she called me. So I was very pleased about that. But it's just, it's, depending on the kind of book you have, it's really hard to get publicity. Maybe, maybe a big publisher can be better at that than when you publish yourself. Um, but I, I, but I've, I understand, even when you work with a publisher, you have to make yourself available, and you have to have skin in the game, and you have to do a lot of the work to get out. And how many people can go on tour around the country? Yes? I wanted to add about the, the media interviews. I yes. I just researched that over the last couple of days. And every place I researched said it's, it doesn't work like an impre using a press release or something. Unless you wrap it around an event like oh, this. Oh, yes, yes. That's why she called you. Your book is not interested. She's not interested in your book. She's interested in events. Yes. And your book just happened to be mm -hmm. about, so that's, so that's what the research said, told me that's why she called you. Yes. And that's, you, the more visible you are, um, the more exposure you'll get. The, the first Barnes and Noble event I had, uh, ignorance is bliss. I didn't go online to Barnes and Noble and say, how do you get to do an event at your store? I just took my book and I tucked it in my purse and I went to my closest Barnes and Noble. Ah, there's a grammar day in March, so that's what I hung this, this on. And I went into the store and I said, who does your promotion? Do you have a marketing person? Or is it the store manager? And it was the store manager. And so I said, could I talk to him? So he came out, and I whipped out my book, and I said, I'm a local author. That's another thing. That, that's a hook. They, they like local authors. And I've written a book about grammar. And there's Grammar Day coming up, and I'd love to come into your store and promote my book. So he said, well, let's see. And he went back to the computer to see if it was available. And I have Ingram Spark. So yes, it came right up on his computer. And it was available. And he said, yeah, pick out a day, and let's do it. So. And then I developed, um, you all have that little quiz. It's hard to do a reading with a grammar book. A novel, you can pick something mysterious or exciting or uh, scary, and you can do a reading. But you can't do that with a nonfiction book. And so I developed this uh, little um, quiz, three questions on word use and three on punctuation. So when people come in the door, I always like to be on the front right. Um, and I say, um, I'll bet you haven't taken a grammar quiz in a long time. Or, good morning, happy grammar day. Would you like to try my quiz? Or if it's Barnes and Noble and they're heading over for coffee, I say, how about taking a copy of this quiz along to have with your coffee? But just anything. And some people say, oh, no, no. But you just can't predict who's going to stop. And it's amazing, the people who do. And, um, and then I have a key that I go through the, the, the responses with them. So to have a hook. And also, when you go to a book event, don't ever sit down at a table with your books out in front of you. Stand so that you establish eye contact with people as they come in the door and greet them. And some people will walk by and ignore you, but you have to just let it bounce off, take the rejection, and move on. Because somebody who looks very unlikely will stop and talk and maybe even buy your book. And when you have that engagement, at least two, they know about your book. They might think about it and come back. They might think about, gosh, somebody at work could use this. I'll recommend it to them. It's just a matter of the more exposure you get, the more you're going to get back an interest and in sales. And I think I pushed, pushed the wrong one again. Oh, car sign. That's something I read online that somebody did. And so I had a car sign made, author on board. And it's, maybe you saw my car in the parking lot. Um, and, and then I've got one for the back, ruthlesseditor.com, that goes on the back of the car. And I, I got a phone call one day. Somebody else was driving my car. But she said, hi, I'm right behind you on you know, the 10. I said, looked around, I'm in my office. I said, excuse me? 
And then I realized, she said, yeah, is this the ruthless editor? With you? I saw that on your car. She was looking for an editor for a children's book. And I prefer not to do it, but I said, I'll see if I can find somebody. So I took her name, and I found somebody in an author's group I'm involved in and sent her a name. So you, you just can't tell where, where the leads are going to come from in the interest. Training. Um, of course, nonfiction, I'm talking about grammar. I did a training for admin executive and administrative assistants for J.P. Cullen last fall and developed some grammar exercises. And as part of the training, they bought books for everyone who attended. So that was 30 books. And I welcome 30 books any day. Posters, car sign. Speaking engagements like this. Um, any general questions or specific questions about anything that we've covered? We've got some time left. Back there, yes. I, the, what, what, self publishing can be misleading. Okay, self publishing term, as a term can be misleading because you still need a lot of help. I've probably demonstrated that here tonight. It isn't something you can do alone unless you're extremely talented, extremely confident, extremely resourceful. But if you can, it doesn't have to cost a lot of money. If you can find shortcuts, if you can find talented people, either relations or friends or um, people that you can barter. Maybe there's something you can, you have a talent that they need and they can trade off for something related to your book. Has, has anybody else exchanged services with anybody in writing, in writing or public, those of you who are published? Anybody else know? Do you, do you think self-publishing is a false term? Um, no, I, I, I don't think it's false. I just think it might be more misleading. OK. Because um, you're, you're, you're doing it yourself. You're not hiring. That's right. Self-publishing means you're publishing without the help of a publisher, a traditional publisher who gives you an advance and then you write the book or for the book or whatever. You're, you're doing it on your own. I think the, um, when I decided to self-publish, you have to have a name of some kind. And so I just started feeding things online, putting in for URLs. And I wanted to be Lioness Press, but that was already used. So I end up, ended, just ended up with Ruthless Editor Press. I named it, and I put it in my book, and that makes it exist. So that's the shortcut you take, that you don't have anybody else to work with whose name is going in your book. But I think I understand that it's not really a one-person project because of the components. Not everybody who is good with words is good with art. Not everybody who could design a good cover could write a decent book that's readable or would have, have the inspiration or the topic. Yes? Is there a possibility of finding someone? I've had a very interesting life, very cool. Uh, and I know it's going to be very interesting. But I have no writing skills. I'm a nurse of 57 years. Uh -huh. And that's my specialty. I've just, um, one of your resources is Joan Stewart, the publicity hound. And she's in Milwaukee, and she sends out a blog twice a week. The question is, you have the material that you think would make a good book, but you're not a writer. You're a nurse, as she is. You're not a writer. So can you work with somebody, essentially a ghost writer? And, and that just was, was one of her um, blogs. There's a link to how do you find people who do ghost writing. And yes, I think you could find someone. If you, if you would like to, you've got, you've got the bookmark. If you want to send me an email, I will send you the link to ghost writing and how you might be able to find someone, OK? Yeah, and let's talk a little bit about the, uh, the, little, the handouts. There's, a, there's, of course, one of the PowerPoint. There's one of resources, and there's one of terms. The resource one, I realize that's a lot. <laughs> But there's, there's so much information out there to help you, so much information that can help make self-publishing possible and successful. It takes time. 
it takes time to go online and to delve into them and compare them with others that you see. But gradually, you begin to accumulate some confidence that you know how you can make a decision on this because you've read in six places that this is true, or this is the case, or this is recommended. Um, there's also, there was one, we had, we had some conversation about the four great myths of publishing. And there was some concern about copyright. And it's a wonderful article, and I can't give it to you in this setting tonight. But if anyone would like to send me an email, I can send you that as a PDF. Um, and if you send me an email, I will reply with what you want. I will not put you on my mailing list. <laughs> I promise. I, I don't do that, especially these days with the new privacy stuff and so on. If you don't request to be on my mailing list, you, you won't be there. So, but if, if there's something I can f answer as a follow-up, or if you'd like to know the four great myths of, self, of book publishing. What is that, the title? Angela, you have it back there. What is it? Four myths of self-publishing or book publishing? Uh, the four great myths of book publishing. Book publishing, OK. That talks about the difference between self-publishing and traditional publishing. And it's, it's excellent. And I'm sorry, I can't give you a copy tonight. Yes? I was just going to ask you, you were talking about Microsoft Word. Is the, yes. Uh, Your manuscript, your original, right. yes. Is, is that kind of across the board? Is that like the old standard? I think it is. Word processing? Mm -hmm. Because most, if I, I'm thinking about Joel Friedlander, if, if you were to use his format, he says you take your Word document and do this with it. Okay. So I think that's fairly standard. Okay. There are probably some people who can work with other programs. Is there one called Pages? It seems to me I've heard of that. That's is that for Macs? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, it, even if you wrote in that, you could take it and dump it into a Word document, and then you'd have the Word document to use. But I think micro, Microsoft Word is a fairly universal straight writing program. Other questions or comments? Yes. I'm, I'm confused about the CreateSpace and Ingram Spark. Okay, I'm not surprised. Spark <laughs> yes. before. Uh -huh. um, are you essentially doing the same thing with two different companies, or do you do your create space and then also send, when that's mm -hmm. all done, send that to Ingram Spark? Question. What is the, I, I'm not sure I'm understanding. Okay, the, the question is about the difference between Ingram Spark and create space. Both of them, both of them provide the same kind of service in that once you write a manuscript and you want to turn it into a book, um, you have to get the pages formatted and so on so that it's all ready to upload to their website. They have, it has to be a PDF and each of them has specifications for how that PDF is created and that's above me. I don't do technology that well. And that's why I worked with this neighbor who was a master at it. And so he was able to take my Word document and put it in the format that was ready to upload to both. And they're different. They're different. They're two different entities, okay. two different business entities. When you upload to CreateSpace, you automatically, your book will be available on Amazon. And they have some choices about how you want it distributed. They will, they have an, I think it's called extended distribution. Mm -hmm. If you check that, they say it'll go international, it'll, it'll be available to libraries. Libraries would prefer not to order from Amazon. They prefer, prefer Ingram Spark. Just because I don't, I don't know exactly why. They have relationships with them. Do you know? Do, okay. Just libraries prefer Ingram Spark. In fact, there's a, there's a distributor, a sub-distributor with Ingram, Ingram Spark that's called Baker and Taylor. And I've been to some libraries, taken my book in and asked them if they would carry it. And they say, is it available through Baker and Taylor? Because that's who we use. Well, if you're with Ingram Spark, you are available through Baker and Taylor. They have broader distribution. Ingram Spark deals more with book wholesalers and book retailers and libraries. Create space is Amazon. So that's the biggest difference. It's not only Amazon, but people who order books to sell 
prefer to, to get their books from Ingram Spark. Is it the same book? Yes. Well, yes. It, it's, 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 they both come from the same file that you uploaded. But some, sometimes the print might be a little heavier. The color red on my book might be a little bit different from one to the other. But I don't think that's a big deal. OK, so you could the, look at two of your books and not really discern the, who it came from. That's right. You could look at my book from Ingram Spark. You could look at my book from Amazon. And you could not tell the difference. And do they need the same ISBN? Yes, ones? you have one ISBN. OK, so they're just being produced by two different sources yes. with the same ISBN. And distributed a little differently, yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. With Create Space, that they own that ISBN forever? Yes, so then that's right. That work if if you use part? Create Space and you don't have your own ISBN, they assign it, and where it says Publisher, oh, it see. says Create Space. Okay, if you if you give Create Space your uh, your ISBN, if purchase, that, yeah, I, then I own it. You're the if you oh, if okay. you buy your own ISBN when you're formatting and laying out your book, you enter that number on the page where it goes with the copyright information, and then that's. That is your, that's identified with your name forever, wherever it goes, whoever sells it, whoever produces it. Okay, I misunderstood that. Okay. Yeah, see, that's why I say ISBNs, and I think it's hard, too, to distinguish. Because, and the other thing, too, is some people have had the experience, in fact, my friend who publishes from covers, buys covers and writes the stories, he uploaded a file to Amazon, and then he decided he'd really like it to be available on Ingram Spark. He had to pull it from Amazon for a certain period of time before Ingram Spark would upload it and make it available. And so that's why I say if you're going to use both, put it on Ingram Spark first. You'll have your own ISBN, so you do that. And then once it's available through Ingram, then do it through Amazon. And I don't know why that is. I, I can't explain it, but it's, that's the way it is now, and that may change as everything else evolves. But for now, Ingram Spark first, if you're going to use them, and Amazon after you know it's available on Ingram. Other questions? Go ahead. Yes. Oh, even uh, discounting the ISBN and, and publishing there, can you touch on uh, publishing rights, even if you go to the uh, publisher, it says, well, we want this, this, and this before, you know, we'll put out the book. Well, first of all, no publisher, you should not be paying a publisher. Um, if they're asking you for money, they're probably not, not real credible. They expect to make money when your book sells. So um, some publishers will have de uh, requirements, though, that you buy a certain number of books. I'm sorry, did that answer your question? No, tell me again what it was. Some publishers might have rules about their distribution. Oh, oh OK. And they'll say, we, we want to reserve the right for first or second publishing and mm -hmm. you know, releases before you can even talk to somebody else. Yes. Q question is about if you work with a publisher, what rights do they have to your book? Or how, can they preempt your rights in some way? Because I haven't worked with traditional public publishing, I can't say I know the answers to those things. I do know, though, that it, it, your copyright, um, all you have to do, let me back up a minute. Once you put words on a screen, you're protected by copyright. That is your work, or pen to paper, or however you do it. When you publish your book, the copyright has your name on it, or the, press, the publisher on it, whichever it is. And you don't have to file that anywhere. You don't have to. You can. You don't have to do anything more than just put copyright in your name. You're considered protected by copyright law. That copyright lasts for 70 years after your death. You can register your copyright. And I'm sure there are lots of attorneys who would suggest that you do that. You can do it online. There is a small fee. You can also register your book with the Library of Congress if you want to. And I don't know that that does anything for you other than maybe your ego. And then there's a permanent record forever because you have to send a copy of your book to the Library of Congress. Maybe that's a heady feeling for someone. Because my book is based on grammar information that's available to everyone, I didn't invent it. 
I didn't trademark the comma. So my information is general. I did not file a copyright formally because I first of all thought, do I have the money to hire an attorney to, fee to sue someone? Plus, how can I really track it? Plus, how can I call it my own? I didn't invent the language or the rules. So um, you know, rationally, that's what my thought was. It might, be, might not be correct. If you've got proprietary information or you're sharing something that you developed, in fact, there's a, I just finished a book by an author who coaches people on public speaking, and he has trademarked words like, instead of, story, instead of storytelling, he calls it story selling. That's his term for using stories when you're speaking. And he has trademarked that, so he's protected that. And he has a couple other examples like that. So you know that's protected by trademark and copyright law, but he had to file that with an attorney. Um, and that can get expensive. So copyright, you can assume you're covered, but if, if you find somebody uses your work and doesn't give you credit, then you have a decision of how you're going to approach it. Yeah, and there was another question? Yeah, it's a little contentious issue, but with fiction writing, mm -hmm. I've really stayed away from self-publishing on my manuscript thus far, because every novel I've read that self-published is just riddled with errors. And I <clears throat> feel like self-publishing is getting a bad reputation for that. I yes. I don't know if I want to go that route or not. She has a fiction book. She's leery about self-publishing because anyone can publish and there's a lot of junk out there. I too have read some very un unacceptable writing that is, as she says, riddled with errors. That's true and that's why, remember I mentioned getting the little blurbs, the uh, quotations for the front? Um, credible people can say things about your book that, that can help counteract that. And I think if I walk into a store, I'm a self-published author, I have to work hard to convince them that I am credible and that I do good work. And of course, if you can leave a book with them, they'll know that. Or you hope that you'll be able to, to support what your claim is. But it is, I think that is a problem for bookstores, for independent bookstores like Book World. If so, a local author comes in and said, will you carry my book? They don't want to say, oh, sure. They want to see it and make sure that it reflects well on their professionalism as a retail outlet. It, it, it's something to overcome. And certainly anybody who's thinking about publishing can try. Um, Angela wrote a query letter and sent, I think you said, a chapter to someone. And she is a poorly written chapter. But just share briefly, we're, our time is out, but. Well, I was fishing, and I, I'm writing a memoir, and I a memoir, just, I right. sent a memoir, and I sent it out to, in Jeffrey Herman's publishing guide. Um, Did you find the name of the, of the person online that you wanted to I send to? I looked online, I looked for every agent, every ghostwriter, anyone who worked in, with memoirs. And okay. I so you found a memoir out, specialist. I sent, I sent it to about 20 people, and my phone rang almost immediately. And I just got lucky. And it was a, a, a famous, uh, a, a well-known, well very credible, <laughs> yes. New York Times uh, uh, best-selling ghostwriter who has written for Pat Riley and Wolfman Jack. And he was taken, you know, he could see, he's, you know, he was very kind and he said, you're doing a great job as an amateur writer, but my fees are, you know, so whoever was asking about the ghost writing, yeah. it can be, it, depending on the content, <coughs> um, my book is 21 chapters, there's a lot in it. And it can be very expensive, so, uh, I just lucked out. <clears throat> I realize I have to make it interesting enough right, to right. win him over to begin with. I just took a chance. I had been working on it for a long time. I knew that uh, that my story, my family story, is like no other. No other. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and That's I knew I, I knew the, my target market as well. I mean, and I did a lot of research, and I just kind of I was fishing. I thought, let's just see. And I just got lucky. 
So, so I, I think too, Angela, you did a lot of research. You say you got oh, lucky yes, finding yes. someone to work with, but you did a lot of research. And yeah, picked him out for other things he had done. And you have to have facts and documentation, you know, to back it up, mm -hmm. because you can't just, you know. I, I'm talking about, you know, when you're writing about yourself or your family mm -hmm. or. So there was a lot of research, months and months. It took a lot of time, and it was well worth it. We're going a little bit over, but I did want to mention there is a, a feedback form. This is helpful to know what you found helpful, what you didn't find helpful, suggestions you have. It's short, if you could take just a minute to complete that and leave it, just leave it at your place or at the end of the table, I would really appreciate it, and the library would appreciate it too, so they know what kind of programming to bring to people. Any further questions or comments? Yes. If you were looking, and you may have this in your resource sheet, I'm um, okay. looking for someone to do the technical part, the formatting. It, how expensive is a, ven a venture is that? How expensive is the formatting? It depends on what and how much you need done. Um, and how, what kind of source you want to work with. I think someone like Joel Friedlander is very credible and uh, has a good reputation. He's well known in the industry and I'm sure he's very busy and he probably has people he delegates things to. On the other hand, when I needed my formatting for the ebook, I went online and worked with a service in India. And that was okay. I saved some money probably, but I didn't feel 100% good about it. So you find people by by going online and looking at their recommendations, I would say. If, if you need computer expertise, Google, ask around. There probably, I think every community or area has writers groups. And if you can hook into one of those, you might find some good resources and you can benefit from the experience other people have had. So I would recommend that. Or start a writers group. Um, because there's, there's a lot that you can share Work that you've done could help her, and things you know about could help her, and you can share your experiences. That's why we're doing that. That's ah, they're, <laughs> they're already connected. Thank you all very much thank for coming. You, thank you. And, thank you. and thanks to the library for this wonderful space. <laughs>